Hi everyone, this is Jacqueline Sarandria, the Conference and Meeting Manager for SMTA. I'd first like to begin by thanking you all for attending this SMTA webinar. Uh, our featured speaker for today is Mike Creedon from Inselectro, and he will be presenting Avoiding the Most Common PCV Failures. Before we begin, please consider the following copyright statement. Applicable copyright laws protect all presentation materials. Any unauthorized use, duplication, or distribution is strictly prohibited. As for questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time via the webinar interface, and Mike and I will address them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will turn this over to you, Mike. Thank you again for being here with us today. Well, thank you very much, and I would like to welcome everyone for attending today. Um, so that's, uh, I think, good morning and good evening to some of you if you're further east than I am. Um, I am broadcasting from uh, California today. And I would like to thank uh, Tanya and Jacqueline and Carly and, and some of the other folks at SMTA for uh, bringing this uh, webinar today. And uh, just a, a, the shout out to SMTA. You know, I've had the privilege of attending and participating in the local chapter um, for quite some time. And just the value that they bring to our industry, they, they really need to be esteemed in our eyes. Um, because uh, what they do is they bring, provide a place where we can all come together, uh, exchange ideas. And as you can see from this slide today, um, on the left side, you'll see the PCEA. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, uh, Printed Circuit Engineering Association. Um, but today's um, topic of avoiding the most common PCB failures, um, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at some design for solvability design for performance, design for manufacturability. I'll exp explain those three perspectives. Um, and also knowing some of the end product requirements um, and some of the manufacturing process allowances will prompt us to design for high reliability and producibility. Um, so with that, let's kind of start rolling into this. Uh, this is my bio slide and I really, it's, sometimes referred to as my ego page. I don't need to stroke my ego. Um, I share a lot of this to show some of my involvement, which um, really translates into my passion for this industry. So again, uh, SMT on the top, thank you for bringing this today. Um, I'm grateful for Inselectro, uh, my employer. They are a distributor for um, I, Isola, DuPont, and many of the materials that your fabricators use. Um, they're North America's leading distributor for those product lines. And I'm a technical director for design education. So my role is to truly do what I'm doing today and, and share some insights on how we can design better boards and that your circuits would work. The PCEA, I'll explain that in the next two slides. Um, uh, is that something that's new and upcoming and I serve as uh, the vice chair on that uh, and on the executive board. Also the uh, IPC CID curriculum, I'm one of the primary contributors to that curriculum. Um, I serve uh, as a, with EPTAC, which is that lower icon on the right there. They are the uh, North America's leading uh, educator um, for fabrication, assembly operators, and also bringing to you the designer's certification. That's the IPC CID and CID Plus certified IPC designer. The MIT is um, a master instructor, master IPC trainer, uh, which means that I train the trainers there. Um, the bottom line is that for 44 years, I've been in this profession. I have a passion for it. I love PCB design layout engineering. So I hope that comes out in what we're talking about today. I hope everyone enjoys themselves. Um, I'm really kind of a relaxed person. So hopefully we're having some fun when we do this today. So uh, let's keep going here. But I told you I'd tell you about PCEA, the Printed Circuit Engineering Association. Um, this is a newly formed this year. And so what a year to have a breakout of a new organization. Um, PCEA is an international network of engineers, designers, fabricators, assemblers, anyone that's related to this printed circuit development. Okay, our mission is to promote printed circuit engineering as a profession and encourage 
facilitate and promote the exchange of information and the integration of new design concepts through communications, seminars, workshops, professional certifications, through just a network of local and regional affiliated chapters. So um, there's a look at our new web page, which just released in uh, June. So I encourage you to join it. Um, we've uh, been collaborating now with SMTA. They're kind of like the uh, the big brother or sister on the uh, in our family here of uh, in this industry, and they've been very helpful to us, coaching us. Um, our membership is free. I think we're probably a lot looser of structure than what they are. Um, we're probably not bringing half the benefit that they are at this point because they're much more seasoned. Um, so skipping all that kind of discussion. Um, I encourage you to go up there and look at the mission statement, um, essentially summed up and that it's our goal is to collaborate, to inspire and to educate. So therefore PCEA is very grateful that SMTA is providing us the opportunity to speak. We will be actually providing a, an education track at the SMTA International, which is um, held at the end of uh, September. Um, I believe, uh, check the dates there. Um, lest I give you an erroneous date, but uh, we're eager to contribute to that. And uh, so it should be a track of several uh, courses. So with our presentation today, let's get started. I've put this and I've titled it the most important slide and anyone who's ever listened to me speak is, I'm sure getting lovingly sick of this image, but this image is meant to emblazon that on our minds because it is what's truly required as we seek to develop our circuitry and our products. And if I say DFM or DFX, everybody kind of knows that. But I did list the early ones up front, the DF solvability, DF performance. So taking a quick look at those, the solvability is a skill set to solve the place and route of all parts and connections. And oftentimes this is on a high density board, so the HDI. And so it's like a 3D puzzle to solve. And all that has to be solved on your CAD tool. And so to those of you who do operate um, a CAD tool, um, I applaud you at your expertise and I, you know, I, I admire your the tenacity it takes to master these tools. There's some wonderful tools out there and um, they really enable us to do a good job. So I'm applauding that. Um, the next one going to the left there is the uh, design for performance. Um, there are, you can build, you can connect a board and solve it. You can make it so it's manufacturable, but if the electronics in it does not perform, you can throw it away. So it's just such a valuable um, component to making revision one work. Um, and that's signal integrity, the EMI, EMC, which is the electromagnetic interference or electromagnetic compatibility, kind of the what goes in or the what goes out of electromagnetic uh, energy. Power delivery, PDN or thermal requirements. These are all performance metrics that truly have to um, work. And the last one on the right there, it designed for manufacturability. The best way to figure out how to design for manufacturability or development for excellence is to be in constant communication with your fabricator and your assembler. And so I, I my understanding is we have a diverse audience here today. And so I appreciate everyone coming from those different uh, industry perspectives, but I'm hoping that my uh, manufacturing brethren and sister out there are giving me an amen on that one, because when you collaborate with them early, we're gonna look at why that makes a significant difference in making revision one work. And so when I say revision one working, what do I mean? The result is on the bottom, that you have a maximum placement and routing density, but it has optimum electrical performances and it's efficient defect-free manufacturing, okay? High yield and high producibility. So uh, that triangle, the design engineering triangle. So, when we first started discussing this topic of how do we uh, target, say maybe and avoid errors, 
we started talking about this and we said, well, let's name five of them. Let's just maybe start there. And we kind of went with a slightly different approach to this. And I hope you find it valuable. Um, we're going to look at a much broader uh, perspective and not just target on one or two types of errors because it's really more important is how do you find errors? How do you detect them? And where can they come from? Because if you know that, you can work to avoid them. Just finding an error, that's not the goal here. It's preventing the error. That's the goal. So that's bear with that over, overall uh, thought process as we look at what we're going to look at in the next um, dozen slides or so. And if you've got any questions, kind of write them down. And again, Jacqueline will allow us to look at them at the end. So when we start a circuit, the engineering starts truly in the planning stages, goes into the schematic and that. Who do we involve in, in our board? If we involve people late in the game, we don't get their perspectives. When we involve them at the very beginning and they tell us, oh, this criteria has got to be met. Oh, I'm so glad you told me early. Now I can incorporate that. Because if I try to put it at, at the back end, I'm kind of bandaging it in and it becomes error prone. So how we collaborate at the beginning, develop a team approach, okay? How you work together and how you communicate and where you've really researched and gathered all the expectations that are gonna make a difference, okay? That everyone, including your supply chain, or I should even say, especially your supply chain, you know, everybody's informed on the common goals. And uh, so I have a whole bunch of DFs up there as we've talked about, but the goal of producibility and reliability and robustness, I'm gonna target those words because they're important and how we react to them. So of course, cost and stuff like that. So um, that's that slide at the beginning. So avoiding failures, remember I told you that's really our goal here. And so understanding what is the road we're gonna drive on? What is What are we gonna do with this? And the principle of GIGO, garbage in equals garbage out, um, we've all heard that and it, it's very appropriate in the engineering and development world. Because if we want to avoid failures, what kind of failure point detection do we have? Okay, can we detect them as they occur? Because if I can detect them at the very end and I don't know where they occurred, that's flawed. I'll never prevent them. So the when and where failures creep into our process is so important, okay? The when, okay, and where, you know, we're gonna look at that. So when we're developing something and, you know, I had the uh, privilege to um, be the founder and uh, the CEO or the chief, cook and bottle washer of San Diego PCB Designs. I sold that to uh, an assembly house, Milwaukee Electronics, and uh, San Diego PCB Designs is still doing a lot of boards. But when serving there, I learned that everyone is always coming along and I say, well, um, how many are you gonna build on this? Says, oh, we're, we're only building five. And I go, well, okay, that's your prototype. Yeah. And I go, how many are you gonna build in production? He goes, oh, a million. <laughs> So you see that answering and say five in a prototype was a very inappropriate response to my question. The question really needs to be said, how many will you be building in production? Because you can prototype and you can MacGyver anything to work with a quantity of five. Uh, but if the production count is very high, totally different set of factors. So there's a development cycle shown all the way on the right there. Take a look from an integrated library to the schematic to the layout. You fab the board, then you assemble it. And, and then there's this whole test software ops build. And that becomes the prototype build. Okay. And then let's just say you got the circuit working. You made revision one work. The next thing you might do is you'd go into a pilot build. Also a limited um, volume, but the whole purpose of that is to basically pilot it into production. So detecting any kind of production issues that they might find there. And then production obviously is a how many will you build per year? How many years life expectancy do you have? Very All very important metrics to know 
when you're developing because you will make design related decisions based on those answers okay so now let's take a quick look at where these errors come into look in the lower left there in the prototype the design phase your data feature size versus the manufacturing capability now if you were paying attention earlier which manufacturer am i talking about the proto house because they can build anything the pilot or the production house, you need to target the production capabilities. The pilot is really more about shop floor implementation, so it's more process related. Now the production is about long-term reliability issues, and those things come about from usage, from operation, environment, and some of the um, accumulative stresses that occur during the stages of manufacturing because heat is not our friend we're going to take a look at heat coming up so remember that heat is not our friend we're going to see how heat will bother us during usage manufacturing operation and environment so again when we first started looking at what types of errors I just couldn't help but throw up a ton of good images up on this stage to show you what some errors look like because you know there could be five most common ones but if you get hit with the seventh eighth and ninth you still got a failure so we need to not just focus on the five most common we need to focus on all potential type of errors and how do we prevent them how do we detect them when they are occurring so um Again, many types of failures occur. So just kind of blast through the list on the left. Uh, thermal, I told you heat is not our friend and you get that manufacturing operation and environment. Um, how many thermal excursions is a, a way to phrase that. I mean, think of a regular board. I'm gonna send it through multiple lamination presses and fabrication, okay? And then I may even in heat cycle some of testing the vias afterwards and then in assembly how many you know reflows is there surface mount two sides and then some you know uh, flow solder so three thermal cycles there and and then during operations okay well the operations is this is a transmitter so it heats up a lot oh the environment are you in alaska or are you in phoenix arizona so the environment plays a major factor. So what type of errors, shorts and opens? Those are probably the most common. You know, some assembly ones, component orientation or the inappropriate feature sizes. That's a, a design error that shows up into fabrication. It could show up into a bad uh, solder land pattern uh, to make an improper solder joint. So some manufacturing process failures, okay? Uh, the solder joint failure is a form of opens or shorts. Delamination, either through heat, through um, environmental, some corrosion or oxidation. I mean, you're seeing some of those pretty pictures there. Some BGA ball breakage, some metal migration. Now you see those top two uh, via issues. Really got to avoid that one because that's just such a failure point of stacking microvias. You should never stack three microvias those are the thin ones up on top and you should never 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 stack them on a buried via that has a um, a non-conductive fill as in the top two slides there so that's an error condition don't do that um, warp and twist and more cracked solder joints probably the most insidious error take a look on the right side in the middle is that cracked via the plated through hole is probably the biggest culprit. If you ask me to name what I thought was the biggest culprit, I'm going to say cracked vias. And it's due to plating. And plating is not the problem. It was really the feature size for plating was the problem. And um, I'm going to make a statement soon so I can, let's see, I'll make it on the next slide. Um, sure. So, Reasons why failures occur. Is it design? Is it fabrication? Is it assembly? People often say manufacturing can only build what was supplied, <laughs> but they often improve it significantly. 
So um, I'm trying to maybe poke some holes in that sentence because if, you know, they manufacturers oftentimes will add and improve feature sizes into production tooling just to make it more robust and more manufacturable. Designers oftentimes will see a uh, drill hole perfectly centered in a pad. Well, in reality, those tolerances accumulate and move. Um, and the real world is you have uh, material movement, drill wander, XY, layer to layer registration, so many different things, machine calibration that um, take a perfect true position feature and move it. So, so design is the root cause. So this is what I was going to say. I have a statement coming up. So there's a statement that I've used is that when you're looking at problems, the guilty person is the person who's not in the room. Okay. Now, am I trying to be uh, sarcastic with that? You betcha. Um, it's a way of saying that uh, I'm sure the problem is somebody else and you point left and right. And the person who's not in the room probably is the guy I suspect. And it's because we're all a little bit in a, you know, secure our jobs and look good for our company. So that kind of occurs. And here's the other paradigm that occurs. When an end product uh, has a failure, they're gonna look to the last person who handled it. So they're gonna say, well, this is an assembly problem. We got the boards from the assembler. The assembler is going to say, yeah, but it's a, perhaps it's a open problem, so it's probably in the pair board. So let's call up the fabricator because that's probably the guilty person. The fabricator is going to look at it and go, but do you realize that I had a uh, hundred thou thick board with a, you know, a six mil drill <laughs> and I couldn't plate it good. So it was really design related. So we're gonna look at all the potential root causes, but just know that that's oftentimes how people diagnose errors. And so we're gonna take a look at that also. So failure to solve the layout accurately or creation of a bad tooling, that's what design could be. Um, this is the circuit performance criteria is not met. Okay, so you built a great board, but it just didn't work well. Why? Because the energy fields didn't go where they were supposed to go. Someone didn't provide adequate return path. A board inadequate feature size, that typically equates to low producibility. I can build it and it'll work, but you know, I don't get a high yield out of it. So it's hard to produce. I actually have to build twice as many panels to get a good functional yield. Okay, and then could it be a board fab or assembly process or material failure? Yes, but typically that's not the first place I'm gonna look. So uh, this is kind of an eye bleed. That's why you see some red up there. I'm not gonna read all of this, but uh, where do the failures come from? Uh, you can get these slides, Jack, and I'll probably make these available. I think this will be posted on the YouTube channel. Um, but um, know that Schedule slippages a lot of times. That's, you know, haste makes waste. And we're always running late because we're engineering. It's a discovery science. And sometimes you could have an unqualified development staff. I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, or maybe they don't understand the manufacturing capabilities or requirements. Um, already talked about some uh, performance issues. And here's a a problem that happens a lot, and I'm going to show you on the bottom right. Essentially, they were designed for the lowest level of producibility. In other words, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Well, that doesn't mean I should use that weakest link everywhere I go. So the one on the left shows I needed a very thin trace to go through these pads. Well, why didn't I make it wider as soon as I got out past the pads? Now it's more robust. Now this is a flex type of circuit. So you see even on the farthest right one there that I had the little tags that presents padless lifting. So again, it's made more robust. And you also see the teardrops have been added. In again, in case the drill movement. So those are things to take. Don't design for the minimum requirement. Design to make it robust. And um, 
So the performance thing is the middle slide there showing that the uh, energy field, it's imperative to send that to the ground plane, okay? Um, the other thing is the annular rings. That's a, one of the biggest plating problems is what's defined, how do I make an aspect ratio? And the left icon is just the, uh, the schedule monster telling you to get this board done. So this slide here, diagnostic questions and analysis, you know, identifying some of the faults, um, is it an assembled, a bare board or a design? Um, you know, what is your failure discovery process? You know, you truly have some method of looking at that. You know, is it a specific singular failure point or is it multiple failures, but only in a specific region? Because that tells you something, that region of the board and, you know, is he experiencing something, whether it's thermal or in manufacturing maybe, or maybe the feature size is in that region. region. If it's a consistent failure, but it's scattered all around the board, that tells you something also. It's pretty much telling you that there's probably a bad feature size that's showing up all over the place. Is it repeatable? If it's consistent, you probably have a design problem right there. And that minimum feature is just, showing what its failure point is. Now here's the most insidious one, the intermittent failure. It occurs occasionally or under certain conditions. This is very predominant. It's if I have a via cracked via and I can test it on a cold board and it works fine. But then when I heat it and thermal expansion causes it to open up and then you have a failure point and then it cools down. I test, I go, well, it's good. I tested it cold. I needed to test it in a, a hot mode, okay? Now here's the last one that is again also insidious is that do you have a preconceived bias? Do you have a horse in the dollar race here? And you all know what I'm saying with that. It, it, it's just, do I have a financial incentive or is that am I trying to keep my job? Sorry, but I got to call this out because we oftentimes do have preconceived biases um, and there's usually our self-preservation, but um, you got to be honest with yourself if you're really trying to do that. Are you being honest? So um, that's my call to integrity. Um, this slide, I've laid it out different just to break up the graphics um, because this is important too. This gets back to the horse and the race. Do you have inductive reasoning or deductive reasoning? Okay. Is it objective or subjective? Okay. Is it objective meaning looking at all the facts or subjective looking at the facts I want you to look at? Okay. Guilty party not in the room. It's those come into play, you know. But what we really need to do is what is our research data set? Have you truly done a good cross section or cross sample? Okay, is it broad analysis or targeted analysis? What kind of testing equipment or process? Do you follow any kind of statistical process control that truly identifies um, this, you know, over a, a good broad cross section or sample? Is it destructive sampling like on coupons? Well, you'll save money with that. Okay, is it consistent or random? And do you have a quality assurance inspection uh, plan and process? So these, again, I'm not going to get into detail on all of them, but again, these are failures that are when design is the cause. Most of them are feature sizes or not understanding the manufacturing uh, process requirements. Um, the um, You can design a certain trace width, but your fabricator typically has to oversize that, okay, because they have etched loss or they have to oversize a pad to ensure there's no drill breakout. Um, we'll take a look at probably some of those. But again, from a CAD design, look at that image on the right. Every via hole is perfectly centered, you know? Well, what if that via was to move right where the trace comes in? You would have an open and you would not be able to plate that hole well. And therefore you might have an intermittent failure that shows up on the assembled board and gee, let's blame the assembler. <laughs> it's inappropriate, okay? Um, so most of these I think I've already hit before. So, um, well, here's one I'm gonna talk on is bad design practices like not fixing all your DRC, design rule check. If you have a violation of that, many people say, well, that's an acceptable error. Well, 
if you start allowing a bunch of those, the danger is, is that there might be hiding amongst all those acceptable errors, a true error that should be corrected. So um, I always encourage the designers I worked with to, you know, don't allow, uh, have allowable DRC violations, satisfy them all, make this correct by construction so that you have 100% DRC and just run it uh, early and often. Um, sometimes teamwork during development, this can occur where, uh, because I'm on a schedule, I'm just trying to throw people at it, thinking that I'm going to get a perfect result. And it's the team leader who had the intellectual knowledge from the development and architectural team. And if they lose contact with somebody implementing the circuit, there's too many instances and variables um, for an error to be hidden and right there in the design. And when you think of a board with 5,000 parts, um, 100,000 vias, and then you do, you know, 10 boards on a panel, I mean, the amount of permutations on a 12 layer board for 100,000 vias is off the charts. Each one could be a failure point. So um, I'm trying to make that sound large because it is. Um, so the attention to detail you know, both in your design and in your fab drawing and your assembly uh, information really needs to be there. It is in the details. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but it's so worth repeating is do not solve for the minimum parameter, solve for the maximum um, robustness because that produces a higher yield, which always lowers costs and that makes it producible. So, True accuracy does not compromise. That should be, you know, kind of a mantra you're telling yourself. Um, you can see some assembly type of errors that occur here. I mean, I grabbed some pictures that I thought would uh, convey, you know, a cracked solder joint on a BGA. Um, there's so many reasons that a BGA can um, be problematic. Uh, flux being underneath there is one, um, some sort of X and Y, um, coefficient of thermal expansion between the package and the board or dissimilar materials can cause that kind of uh, crack or handling. Any one of those things can do that warp and twist can cause that. Um, the top image, that doesn't so show a good solder joint in my opinion, but the point of a component uh, twisting off or lifting, um, we see that maybe even on the cap on the right there where you have bad you know, solder wetting and that caused one side to solder, the other one not. Or solder bridging is in the lower left image there and that SOIC, you see it between the two. Or even solder bridging between a some sort of trace, uh, adjacent trace that's exposed by the solder mask. So uh, uh, solder joints is probably, the, again, one of the larger things that I've seen in the assembly world. 74% um, of all those defects, well, that's somebody's stats. Um, this image right here, oh, look at the word reliability. I made an error right there. You see that? This is how this occurs right in the center of the screen. This is a an image, I call it an IPC cartooned image that IPC has provided to the industry. Um, you can see it all over the place. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything on there. It's uh, way too much of an eye bleed slide. But it shows you how many potential types of errors can occur on a plated through hole. And typically, the plated through hole of most concern is the via. And it's the most concern because typically it has the highest aspect ratio, which is the relationship of the board thickness which is what I need to plate down to the drill diameter. So that is the board thickness over the drill diameter. So if the board was a 60 mil board, um, 1.5 millimeter board by a six mil drill, that's a 10 to one aspect ratio. That can be problematic. So learning what your fabricator calls a good aspect ratio is imperative. I'm not going to tell you what a good one is. Your fabricator needs to tell you that. They're the ones that will build it. Um, I can suggest what they might be. but um, So again, cartooned image, 
but uh, you see that there's a lot of different types that can occur. You see the material has a two components to the material in there. Essentially, your dielectric um, material between the copper metal layers um, com are comprised of both a resin and a weave. It's called a glass weave. And you actually can see the pattern in the XY fashion in the dark green uh, uh, strands there. And those expand in the X and the Y, but it's the resin that expands in the Z axis. And that's what threatens most of your plated vias. So um, it's why your materials really can matter from a manufacturing perspective is because of that equation. The coefficient of thermal expansion in the Z axis threatens your via holes. So assembly failure points, um, I love these little images they show of the assembly floors. Um, assembly floors love to show off how good their floors look. And, and if you've never taken a tour, work with your assembly house, go visit their facility, learn their process. They love to show it off. They want to build a relationship with you as a manufacturing partner. So call up your um, manufacturing supply chain, both fabricator and assembler, tour their facilities, learn from them. Don't just be a tourist, be truly a student. Solder bridging, plating voids, um, you can read the list. Um, these are all different types of occurrences that are again either design, fab or assembly related, but they're causing opens and shorts. Um, and again, the cracked solder joint is probably one of the worst. There's many contributors to that. Um, flux residue, again, the flux, you know, prepares the solder um, to be wetted or heated up. And when it's left on the board, it um, can be a contaminant, um, which can cause a lot of problems. So, um, okay. Um, so again, where the error occurs from, is it all of these places? Is it some of the above? Uh, all those potentials could exist. Is it automated or is it manual? You see in the lower left there, manual. Most manual assembly solder people are incredibly precise. So don't just think blaming them is an easy target because they're not. These are dedicated, highly trained, skilled professionals. Do not think that that human, uh, you know, coefficient is, is, is that high. Is it potentially there? Sure, it is. But don't just rush to that assumption because they're very skilled. So in summary, high producibility with a high yield and high reliability. That's our goal because it's going to equate to a low cost and a low failure rate. Okay. And some of the ultimate goals to ensure that the design data is correct by construction, that it's manufactured with the high producibility and again, you can have high producibility on some features and maybe a little bit lower on the other. In other words, my, see, my trace width is thin, but my vias are robust. So your board can have both of those. And bear with my battery. <laughs> uh, the high yield, the low cost are things that we need to be tracking. Um, I'm making sure my power is on. Anyway, um, but we're near the end. The high yield, lower cost, and the high reliability. I've said all that. That being said, I'm going to open it up and thank you for listening. And I'm going to say, do we have any questions? Thanks, Mike. That was an awesome presentation. You provided thank us with a ton of information. All right. It does look like we have a question. And to all of you that are um, still listening in, please feel free to submit your questions because um, we can go to the end of the hour or whenever Mike's laptop dies. <laughs> no, I um, just plugged it in. There we go. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, so feel free <laughs> to keep submitting your questions. Um, the first question is, um, would you agree that the best way is the same person should handle the layout for revision one and rest bin IDs needed that they will never take shortcuts? Um. So... <laughs> whoever just asked that question, make that person a manager, because that's just brilliant. <laughs> um, the reality is you're gonna be challenged that. That's wonderful thinking because the intellectual um, property or intellectual knowledge of that circuit knowledge is a wealth of information. And so to just hand it off to somebody else is ignoring that truth. 
And so whoever's asking this question has lived in this world to ask that question. It's an incredible thing. And the second part of that question, would you restate that, please? What was the second part of that question? Yes, it says, I'm just going to read it again. Would you agree that um, the best way is for the same person to handle the layout for revision one and RESPIN IDs needed, then they will never take shortcuts? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, well, guaranteeing that they'll never take shortcuts, I guess the real world says that we're always looking for shortcuts because we're under a scheduled gun. You know, there's, a, there's somebody with a schedule chasing after us. So the threat for shortcuts is always there. Um, so, you know, being aware of it is your best thing. And know what you can and cannot take shortcuts on is, you know, that's what experience gives you. So um, it's very astute to be concerned about that, though, because shortcuts usually are uh, how errors creep in. Next question. Well, it actually looks like that that was the only question. I'm going oh. head on the back to you because you're a detailed presenter, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, good. Well, because um, my laptop battery is now plugged in, so um, if there's any other questions, feel free to ask them. Um, I certainly enjoyed uh, taking this time. I hope it was insightful, and I hope it encouraged you everyone to have awareness for the potential of errors and how you detect them and how you work to prevent them before they occur is really the secret sauce that we all need. So, Well, Mike, thank you again so much for sharing your time and your information that you had with us today. And um, to all of you that are listening out there, uh, we do welcome any further attendee comments, suggestions, or input that you have uh, regarding this webinar or any future webinars. So a short survey is going to be delivered to your inbox after this concludes. And we just ask that you take a few minutes to complete it as it's valuable to both SMTA and Mike. So with that said, thank you again, Mike. Thank you to everyone listening in. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and that we'll see you at the next SMTA event. Thank you all. Bye now.